Okay, so hello everybody. Um, today it is my greatest pleasure to uh, actually um, welcome Mark Bortelmi, who is a research director at the Institute for Theoretical Physics uh, in Saclay and a member of the Center for Social Analysis and Mathematics at the Ecole des Autodidactes. Uh, and so, uh, science sociale. My, my, my French is Italian, I'm very sorry. Um, and Mark has a tremendous track record in understanding cities with the means of physics and science, natural sciences. And um, nowadays, this is called computational social science also, but uh, your track record goes back much, much longer in this. And um, as we're a group in cultural data analytics and our audience may also be qualitative and so on, I uh, do the same intro I do in classes when I teach uh, Understanding Urban Ecologies, for example, which involves these four books. So some of you may have read about cities with books like this, Jane Jacobs, uh, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And I'm gonna just show you something simple. It's only text. Then in the 1970s, this happened, which is learning from Las Vegas, which is Robert Venturi, Denise Scott Brown, and you can see lots of images. And this is basically how the history of architecture and also urbanism works. So you have maps, images, architecture, plans, and so on. But what you don't have is mathematical equations. This is where things like this comes in, which is a book by Mark Bartelmi, which in this case is the structure and dynamics of cities, similar to the work of Michael Betty, is very quantitative. And I just wanna sort of give you one glimpse of what you're in for. This is just as much to digest as this big book, but that's it. And so we get a true sort of understanding of cities, which is uh, sort of the reduction of description length, you could say, in a sense of, physics, complexity science, um, and uh, social physics, com uh, computational social science, and so on. So this is, um, if you encounter this first, maybe dense and hard, but it's totally worthwhile because you learn a lot of things you don't learn anywhere else. So Mark, the stage is yours. Um, I think you said you give a talk of like 30 to 40 minutes, and then we uh, should have discussion. For everybody else, if you have questions in between, please put them in the chat and like raise your hand and then we sort of uh, will squeeze it in whenever it's possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction and for this nice invitation. Although uh, I will be happy to see one day Tallinn because I've never been there. So uh, I'm, I'm very curious to see this, uh, this city. But uh, today let's make it uh, online. Um, can I share my, my screen? Because yes. I have uh, just, uh, should be here, share, so uh, let me check, uh, do, you, do you see that, is it working? Yes. Okay, perfect. So uh, indeed, I will, I will try to, uh, to make a little talk today, not too long and not too technical, I will try. Uh, and I'm happy anyway to take questions during the talk or after, and uh, we have a bit of, we have some time to, to discuss more technical issues, but I, I wanted to illustrate to you what, what kind of things we can, we can do now. And uh, the, the first, let's say the first uh, 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 remark that we can make is that whatever you call a complex system, the city is certainly one. So many constituents that interact over a, a large variety of spatial scale and temporal scale, uh, so you have individuals, of course, but also companies, governments, etc. And all these agents interact with each other. And the result is what basically what we see. We see some uh, uh, organization, social and spatial, and uh, which is not necessarily planned uh, uh, from above. So you really have some emergence in the, in the usual sense and also in the physical sense you see the emergence of a, a collective phenomenon. So the, the question then is, can we, can we model that? Can we model a city, its evolution? And can we even make some prediction? And, and what are the most important parameters? 
And I think that's the uh, that's that's really the, the the basic question. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm I'm, I'm not sure 100 percent that this is something we can do about all possible aspects of cities. But I will try to show you that on on some particular questions, we can give a, a, a quantitative answer and, and write some equation, let's say. And uh, uh, so the, just maybe to give you a, a very brief state of the art about a, a quantitative aspect, uh, quantitative studies in cities, let me just remind you a few things. Uh, um, as you perfectly know, most of the what is called urbanism is mostly at the qualitative level. So there are no, not so many equations, and people try to discuss and have some, let's say, qualitative understanding of, of cities. Actually, it's 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 with urban economics that uh, people try to make some simplified mathematical models, and so you have a, a huge literature and urban economics and, and, and Krugman, for example, is one of the, the, the most well-known guy in, in spatial economics. And the problem with that is that models are very simplified, which, which I like, which is good for a physicist. The problem is really the relation with data and with rea reality. So mo most of these works, you know, make really a, a very, very simplified assumption without testing them. And, and most of the time they don't test the, the prediction. So that, that's a bit of a problem. Uh, what is really used in many cases are huge simulation agent-based or uh, for cities, it's also called uh, LUTI models, land used and transport integrated. So basically you make a huge simulation. Uh, you put in your computer, everything that you know about the city, the demographic transport networks, etc., And you try to run all this. Um, this is very nice, but you have many parameters and uh, you actually don't control the, the validity of your model. So there's no way basically to, it's very difficult to test and it's difficult to assess the confidence you can have in these models. So of course you will get a prediction. I mean, you can always take a computer, run it and find something, but it's unclear. Uh, 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 it's unclear what you get and what is the value and, uh, and how much confidence you can put in the result. And we saw that in Paris some years ago uh, when the mayor decided to close a, a road segment, a, a urban freeway called the Voie sur Berge in Paris. And basically you had, you know, different simulation telling you that, oh, please close it. It will be nice. The traffic will decrease, etc. And uh, some other simulations said exactly the opposite. And so, you know, and this was a very well defined problem. So just closing a segment of urban freeway inside the big city and nobody agreed. And, and moreover, the simulation were depending on the, on the political side you were. So really left wing uh, simulation said, uh, do it. And right wing simulation, so to speak said, no, no, don't do it. So it's, it's really a big problem. And so it, it really shows that we, we cannot really trust at this point this uh, simulation with many, many parameters. Uh, now, I, I, I won't speak about machine learning. Machine learning is, is just people start to use it. And uh, uh, so it gives some prediction, but here also it's difficult to test. Uh, it, it, it's as always, it acts as a black box and it, it doesn't help to understand cities, but it can be very helpful for, for practical application, but we, we can go back on, on this topic a bit later. Um, so then the, the, the approach that I, I will try to show you is really inspired from what we did in physics is that you have to select what, what you think is important, what are the main mechanism, the main parameters, all the rest being some detail. So this is really the idea of physics is that we, we know that the system is, is super complicated. You have many, many parameters. If you think about there, there are thousands of things, uh, but the, the physics actually showed us that you, you don't need to, to describe all details. They are not all relevant, especially if you are interested uh, at what is happening at the, at the collective, at the global, uh, at the large scale level, let's say. So it's really, it's really the idea that in principle, it should be possible to find a model with the smallest number of parameters that also has the largest uh, number of predictions. So it's really this tension between 
parameters and number of parameters and number of predictions that is interesting. And if you find a, a, a very nice model with very few parameters and that predicts many things verified in data, then you're, you're, you're happy actually. Um, maybe just uh, uh, as I will show you now in the next slide is that I don't think that we, we are not at the stage of making you know, a, a big model you know, predicting everything in a city. Um, so far, what, uh, what I did and ever did is that we focused on an aspect, you know, car traffic or, or population or things like that. We are, in my opinion, we are not at the level of being able to, you know, to simulate all possible aspects in the city. You, I mean, of course, you can, you can try to make such a model, and some people are trying. I, I think in Singapore, there are some uh, things like that that try to simulate everything from social interaction to traffic, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we are there yet. And, and the example in Paris about this car traffic and the simple closure of a road segment, to me, is the, is the demonstration that we are not ready for you know, big simulation of everything in a city. So um, just a quick word is that I think what the difference with this type of approach and, and early approaches from economists is that we have data. We have a lot of data now. And so we can really test our theory. So you know, 30, 40 years ago, when the economists did the, the, the fir first model, we didn't have so many data about cities. And so they were doing mathematics, you know, and discussing the mathematics of the model. Now we can do much more. If you have a model, you can now test it against data. And that's, I think that's a very important point. So you have a lot of data. Not all data is relevant. So it's not because you have a huge uh, uh, amount of data that it will be useful. For example, in, in so-called smart cities, you, you are measuring everything, but basically not everything is, is useful. So. Uh, um, in any case, we have some interesting data about cities, and this wasn't the case uh, uh, 30 years ago. And, and of course, the, the data ranges from, you, you can, for example, if you're interested in mobility, you can follow individuals uh, thanks to their mobile phone, uh, but you also have you know, uh, uh, data over long periods thanks to uh, uh, historical maps. For example, you can follow the evolution of a city and, and the road network, for example, over centuries. So now if you, you can really think about, you know, what is going on on two, 300 years. So this is a, a really interesting time. We have all these type, different types of data available now. So let me try to illustrate a little bit uh, 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 these, these approaches with two, two examples. I could have chosen many more, but uh, these are the, uh, two risks, the most recent uh, I did. And the first one is the, is the um, uh, how can we describe the population growth in cities? And uh, this is related to the famous problem, uh, um, uh, which is called the zip flow in, in, in cities. And basically, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, just a quick slide on the zip flow. Uh, if you rank, uh, so you take a country, you have many cities in it, and uh, you rank all the cities according to their population. So the rank one is the largest city, the rank two is the second largest city and so on. So then each city has a certain population S and it's rank R, which goes from one to the, to the number of cities in this country. And um, basically uh, in the, uh, in, in, in nine, this was first noticed by, by a physicist in 1913 uh, called uh, Auerbach, but then uh, George Zipf um, generalized it. And this is what he showed in his book of 1949. So you plot the population versus rank, and this falls on a, on a nice line. And basically what Zipf uh, uh, showed empirically for cities, but also for, for many other things, you know, um, the number of occurrences of words and books, etc. So it has many applications, linguistics, and, and never many other social sciences. But here for cities, he noticed that the, the population uh, varies with like one over the rank. So basically the second city, its population is the half of the largest city and so on. So this is the zip flow for cities. 
And this is important because it also means that uh, the, the, the distribution of, uh, of the population of cities is not, uh, is not, let's say, a Gaussian where all the cities have the same population plus or minus some noise. No, it means that the population is distributed according to what we call a broad law, which decays as a power law, and which basically means that you have all uh, a whole hierarchy of cities with small cities, medium cities, and a few super large cities. And so there are no, you don't have an optimum size, for example, for cities. They don't have all the same size measured in population. And uh, uh, this, this, of course, was a puzzle for economists, because according to an economist, uh, if you have some optimal principle, you know, a cost benefit, you should have an optimal size of cities, but we absolutely don't see that. And Zipf was the first to show that in a sense. And the point is, how can we understand this relation? And uh, here is another, you know, here's another case. This is in the US. Uh, so it's not a perfect line, but you see there is a nice regularity between population and rank. And this is the first problem. How can we explain this uh, zip flow? Another problem is that, uh, can you explain the dynamics of the rank? So for example, here, uh, this is the rank clock uh, representation. Uh, it was used by, um, introduced by uh, Mike uh, Batty. And so for example, the time is the angle. So you start here from 1876 and you go up to 2015. And uh, so when the time increases, the angle grows and the rank is the radius. So for example, if we take the external blue line, this is the first rank, which means that it's the largest city. In this case, it's France, it's Paris. And you see that uh, Paris was always, I mean, since uh, 1876 and before, the largest city and it stayed first. But then if you look at other cities- What happened in, in 1940, I'm sorry, in 1945? Uh, or is just the, the, the date is absent from Oh, the... you don't have data here. I ah, think okay, okay. We, jumped, uh, we jumped uh, during the war, we, we jumped, uh, so there's no data here. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so you see the rank other cities, uh, uh, it can fluctuate actually. Some, uh, some cities that were absolutely not, uh, you know, were very small, suddenly became super large. For example, you take the, the green line, uh, egg mort here, the green line in, in the 80s becomes, became super important and its rank uh, uh, decreased. I mean, uh, it, it, was, it was ranking from 300 and become, you know, number 20 or 30. And, and so you see some dynamics, the rank are changing. And the question is then, why is that? So although you have some almost, you have some statistical regularity with the zip flow, you have some dynamics. Cities are changing in terms of their importance. Can we explain all this? And this is what I'm, I'm going to, uh, to show you. And this, in fact, this problem uh, 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 can be uh, condensed in one question, basically, is can we write an equation describing the time evolution of the population, uh, let's say SI of T of the city I? So can you write an equation for this, for all these cities in the country? And uh, can you explain the zip flow or, uh, uh, or what seems to be a zip flow and the dynamics? And uh, the answer is yes, but it took some time. So maybe I will, uh, I will skip some technical details, but um, in fact, many people tried to explain the zip flow. And there are many models, for example, Gibra uh, model tells you that the population at time T plus one is basically the population at time T times a factor which, which is a random number, which describes the demographic, basically. So uh, uh, this tells you how much the, the city, uh, the population is increasing. Uh, unfortunately, this is not consistent with data. So, and this is where an economist, uh, Xavier Gabet, came in 99 and proposed a, a variation of this model and said, with a very strange assumption, assumption he, he, he assumed that the, the population cannot decrease below a certain threshold, which, which to me is in contradiction with uh, empirics. Uh, we, some cities disappeared and, and that's it, you know, but well, anyway, if you assume with Gabet that there is a minimum threshold for cities, then you do the math and you find indeed some zip flow under the form 
the population is one over the rank. So this was the situation at two, on 2000 and years after, but there was a problem is that uh, uh, after 2000, people had, uh, geographer in particular, had access to a lot of data and they could test the zip flow. So do we have a zip flow or not? And the answer is that, well, it's not so clear. What we thought to be universal, the zip flow everywhere, and many geographers actually believe the zip flow, but in fact, it's not that true. Here it's a collection of all the, uh, uh, let me remind you uh, what I call here, the zip flow is in general one over R to some power alpha. So in this exponent alpha is of course close to one. This is the real uh, uh, zip flow, but it can be different from one. And this is what uh, was measured here. And in fact, long story short is that you see many different values of the exponent. And in fact, you see many cases where the zip flow is not satisfied. So you don't have a nice straight line. You have a more complicated function so it's actually totally unclear if the zip flow at a certain point, this was in 2017, you had papers saying zip flow is totally wrong, it doesn't work. Some other papers said, yes, yes, it works under certain condition, etc. So it was really messy. And, and this is where I think uh, in this case, it's, it's good to come back to first principle. And the strategy that we used here is that Let's not try to explain if zip flow is, is, is okay or not. So you don't assume that it's valid because all the previous studies, and I think this is a important bias. Uh, many people had in mind, I have to make a model that will explain zip. And at the end of the calculation or whatever, I have to get uh, the zip uh, law. And I think this is, this is a very important bias because it, it stops you in, in really trying to understand what is going on. So here, the point is that let's start from basic first principle and let's try to, to write an equation for this for the population of a city. And uh, this is what I will try to describe here. And uh, let's start from scratch. Imagine that I have a city here, uh, the city I in some country. And what are the cause, what are the reasons why this population, the population of the city will change? Well, First, you have, let's say, the natural growth. You have the, the balance, the demographic uh, uh, budget, uh, uh, birth minus death. So this will give you, you know, a certain number, an additional number of people in the city. That's the first reason. Then there is another uh, another reason, which is uh, international migration. So uh, people can come from another country and go directly, uh, uh, can move to the city. And then, so this is the second reason. Then the third reason uh, is the interurban flow. You are living in some city and for some reason to find a job or whatever, you move in another city. And this is the interurban flow. And, and that's it basically. So what you write is that the, the variation time of, this, of the population of city I is the sum of three terms, the demographic growth, International plus international flow plus interurban flow. And that's it. And um, the good thing is that uh, we have the data for these terms. We have all the data. It's, it's not the easiest data to find, but uh, we had it for uh, these different cases for uh, France, US, uh, UK, and Canada. It's actually uh, not so easy to find the, the interurban. I mean, how many people move from one city to the other city from a year T in a, in a T in year T plus one, for example? That's not a super easy to find. But but we got basically this uh, uh, four uh, data set, and so we could study these different terms: uh, international migration, which is usually super small, in fact, and demographic growth and interurban migration. And the result is, uh, so uh, here I'm jumping very fast, but um, I will try to, to give you a grasp of why. First, the first thing is that international migration are in general very small and negligible. Uh, what is important is demographic growth, and this can be uh, modeled actually as population times a term which is described by a Gaussian process, which means that you have 
on average, let's say uh, uh, birth minus death corresponds to a factor times the population, which is a little bit above one and which can fluctuate. So this is really the natural growth. It's just the city by itself. This is just the budget. And in the data, you can see that it is Gaussian. I think that's uh, so uh, is, is what 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 is what is the the correlation function of eta? I mean, is it is it correlated uh, e to i i i to i plus one, or is it is it is oh. uh, randomly taken from from a Gaussian every time? Yeah, it seems to be. We tested the the independence, and it, it seems really to be a, a random uncorrelated process. And we tested this in the data. So from one year uh, to one. Well, uh, but 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 we, we know, for example, that that Montpellier grows steadily faster than I don't know Lille. Uh, so, so it seems but like, no, like, like this number, for, for example, for Montpellier should be consistently higher than those for Lille. No 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 no. Uh, uh, not not essentially on this uh, growth term. And and let me ju just let me finish and maybe uh, okay. Okay. because. <laughs> This is the first term. This is growth, and from the data, I can I can show you a little bit later. You see, it's a nice Gaussian. We tested correlation. It's really a nice Gaussian term. And this is for those who know. This first term only is uh, the Gibra model. In fact, it's the law of independent random growth, and but it's not enough to explain everything. But what is more interesting is that when you look interurban migration and you look how many people are moving from uh, one city to the other one, this actually is a very interesting term. And after the empirical analysis and some mathematics, you find this second term, which is basically the population to some power, which is close to one, times the noise, and this is where it's important, this noise represents the fluctuation from one year to the other one, and it's not a Gaussian noise. So, sorry to be technical, but this is what we call a Levy noise, which means that uh, it has a non-zero probability to be super large, either positive or negative. So it shows that, in fact, you have interurban migration, which are you know, random and more or less equal to some value. But sometimes you have a jump, a kind of a, a migration shock. Sometimes and we, we come to the reason later, sometimes you have a huge value. And this, in fact, is what controls the dynamics, and as I, I will show you, uh, of, the, uh, of the population. So you really have two terms. One, thing is, one term is endogenous, so to speak. It's a natural growth, let's say, plus interurban migration, which, are really, which is really the the, 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 the the important driver and which makes the difference between different cities. And that's, that's really coming from the analysis of the data. So basically finding this equation was just, you know, making uh, 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 what are the different causes and let's measure these different causes. And this is the equation we found. And of course you can test it and, and let me, uh, so, what does it tell us about the zip flow and what does it tell us about the, the, uh, the dynamics? Uh, yes, Maximilian, you have a question? Or? Yes, uh, so, so basically what you're saying is that uh, what's sometimes called the fitness of a city is, is fully expressed in sort of the attractiveness of attracting people from other places and not sort of by the growth it has internally in essence. Uh, absolutely. Actually, you're, 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 you're jumping to my conclusion. About oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but it, it, it's exactly, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an optimist message. It means that, you know, what controls the, the fate of a city is not written in stone forever yeah. due to the, to the random growth. No, you have some migration shocks, which are Either negative, for example, you know, and, 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 and you know, uh, we see uh, some accident or, or some industry stopped in some city, people will go away because there are no jobs anymore. Or in a more positive way, some city can suddenly be super attractive because, uh, uh, you know, it creates some jobs or, or, or whatever. So it means that the fate of a city is not written in stone. It really depends on uh, on, on its attractivity, so to speak, on, on its fitness, 
that is of course controlled by other factors, which, is, which are not in this model. This equation is, is somehow uh, descriptive. It tells you that you have some migration shocks um, that describes the statistic, uh, the observed statistics, but it doesn't give you the cause of these uh, shocks. But it's, it's an optimistic message. You know, if you keep only the first term, which is the random growth, the rank would stay constant all the time. So you will have, you know, the most important city, the second one, and, uh, and you know, and life would be extremely quiet and, you know, city would grow quietly and, and keep their rank. What the turbulence in the rank order is really coming from this inter-urban uh, movement that are, that, are, that, can, that are extremely important and govern the rank of a city, in fact. Um, and, and so maybe just to, uh, okay, I will, I will go a bit quick on this part, but this, this equation, I, I will skip the technical detail, but it's, a, it's quite a, a difficult equation. It's a stochastic equation with multiplicative noise, et cetera. So you have to, to describe uh, precisely what you mean here. Uh, and, and it's not, uh, it's, it's impossible to solve in general. You don't have an exact solution for this. There's an approximate solution found by uh, Srokovsky, uh, 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 a Polish physicist, and you can uh, expand the solution for large population. I skip the detail, but basically it tells you that the dominant order, the first, uh, the first term, the most important one is a, is a broad law so consistent with data, but also it shows that the exponent depends on the statistic of inter-urban migration. So it's a more technical detail, but it also shows that uh, you don't have a universal zip exponent and zip behavior, no. Basically what you observe if you see a power law, what you see is that the exponent uh, is determined, is governed by the statistics of inter-urban migration which varies from a, a, a country to another one. So we understand here that we cannot have a universal uh, behavior. And moreover, when you look into detail, when do we observe this power law behavior? Basically, it's almost never. The finite size effect, what we call the finite size effect, which are all the other terms in this theory, are super important. So it means that in general, you don't have a, zip, a simple zip flow. The distribution of population is more complex than just a pure power law. And uh, uh, this means that uh, when people are doing some fits, they can find a large variety of value because of the statistic of inter-urban migration, but also because of finite size effect, et cetera. So I think mm -hmm. that here we give a clear, some clear reasons why since 2000, you observe a large variety of zip, non-zip, or zip with some strange exponent, etc. So here we have an explanation why it is uh, uh, like that. And of course, it's not enough. I mean, and, and for once, this was a positive, uh, can I say, contribution of the, the referees of this paper, because uh, uh, the referees, they told us, okay, it's very interesting, your paper and your result, but zip flow, it's okay, we understand more or less, etc. cetera. Uh, but this is not enough to, to prove that the equation is, is, is reasonable. So can you, can you say something about the dynamics, for example? You know, and this, this was a very constructive remark. And indeed, if you have an equation which describes the dynamic of a population, oh. you should be able to describe zip flow, but also the, the dynamics. And uh, uh, this is what we did. And here are the rank clocks, for example, uh, this is the French case. On the left, you have the real data. So this is really the rank, as I showed you before, for the larger cities in France. So you see some, you know, turbulence and the, the rank is changing. And in the middle, this is what was proposed by the Gabet model in 2000. And, you know, there's absolutely uh, uh, no turbulence. You know, the rank are staying basically constant. And so, in fact, the Gabet model, even if it predicts some kind of zip flow all the time, which is not correct, it's also, it is unable to predict the, the change of ranks. And what we see in our model is that you see some jumps, some cities are changing their rank because all of a sudden there is a migratory shock. Some people are moving from one city to the other one. And this creates, you know, suddenly a city that was not super important 
become all of a sudden super important because many people are coming in. And you can make this statement a bit precise. I will not insist. For example, the probability, this is the, the cumulative probability to have a large uh, rank variation. And you see, and this is in black in France, this is this Levy model. And this is the Gabay model, which, which never sees super large variation of rank. So you can test that and you can indeed show that this equation reproduces uh, uh, the, the, the large rank variation observed in reality. So you have one equation, but which tells you two things. Zip flow is not always valid and we understand why. And the dynamics is turbulent and the shocks are due to migration. So this is really to illustrate, you know, the, 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 the what can I say, the, the strength of going back to basic principle and to forget a bit about, you know, what, what we know, even, you know, the zip flow was one, but there are many others, you know, crystaller principle or whatever, you know, you have many things uh, uh, lying here for almost a century, which uh, you can really test and, and, and start and test from scratch. Um, now, I realize I was a bit, uh, uh, okay, let me, let me give a quick second illustration. How a simple model as physicists could do uh, can help us to understand the data. Is, is that okay? Do we have still five minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally, go ahead. So then, then let, let me talk about something else, not the population, but what, what's happened about car traffic in cities. And probably you saw this, uh, this nice uh, plot proposed in 89 by Newman and Kenworthy. And it's basically the, the, the gas use, gasoline use per capita versus the urban density. So it's a, it's a very straightforward plot, you know, the, and they plotted the, the, how, many, how many gas you are using. So it's basically the car traffic, you know, the, the, the larger this value and the larger the number of cars, you know, and the, 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 the duration of the trip they do versus urban density. And here, of course, you see for small density and large gasoline use, the US cities, and then Europe here, a little bit more denser, but using less cars. And then, you know, uh, Hong Kong here at the extreme right, uh, uh, super large density and uh, a small uh, car traffic, let's say. And this actually in 89, you know, was really one of the basis for many policymakers to say, oh, look, let's, let's make a large density. Large density equal less gasoline use. You know, if you, if, you, if you read this too fast, uh, then this is the conclusion you're jumping on. We have to make the cities denser, and this is how the car traffic will decrease. Because, of course, the car traffic is associated with you know, pollution, congestion, etc. But that's, that's one point. The, the, the other point is that when you see such a nice curve, uh, um, you, you would like to understand where it's coming from, you know, it's really, it's really the gas use and the car traffic controlled by just urban density, you have only one parameter, that, that, that sounds a bit strange, actually, you know, a city is of course described by its urban density, but there are many, many other parameters, you know, how big it is, you know, the area, for example, you know, the, 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 the density of, uh, I don't know, subway, of, of public transportation, of, uh, you know, there, there are thousands, no, not thousands, but there are many other parameters that you can think of. So can we understand this theoretically? I mean, what's the theoretical reason for such a nice curve? Uh, that's my, the main question I will try to answer here. There are other problems with this plot is that, um, um, Everybody cite this plot, uh, nobody really uh, uh, reproduced it. So there is a bit of a problem of data availability and reproducibility of this result. That's, uh, that's uh, another problem, but an important problem that I, I wanted to mention. So anyway, let's assume now, how can we understand this? Uh, this? Assume that you have a population P in your, uh, in your, in your city of area A, that's a very simple, simplified problem. What's the car traffic T? It's a fraction of the population, of course. Uh, can we say something? And here, I will try to convince you that there is some strength in simple model. So let me, uh, let me show you what is this uh, simple model. And here, I will assume that, you know, in the simplest case, everybody goes to the, to the you know, some 
central business district, let's say. So I take this idea of a monocentric city. So everybody wants to work to go to a, 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 a specific place, and which I called office here. And I will assume that the discussion is basically, uh, shall I take my car or shall I go by uh, subway? And uh, the thing is that uh, we'll assume that uh, there you have a certain probability P to have access to the subway, to a subway station, which means that you are at a distance, let's say less than one kilometer. You know, where people say it's the 400 meters or 500 meters wall, but anyway, let's say that if you are uh, living, if your home is uh, less than one kilometer to a subway station, you can take the subway. So then uh, from this little model, you can compute actually the number, the fraction of people taking their car. And it's, I won't show you the calculation, it's quite simple, but let me just give you the argument. Um, on the left, uh, the location X here of the home, there are no uh, 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 subway station in the neighborhood. So it's, this is with quality one minus P. Then there's no discussion, you take your car. There, there's no other uh, uh, mean. Uh, on the right, there's a subway station in the vicinity of your home. This happens with a certain priority P. And uh, then in this case, you can either take the car or the subway. And you have to make some uh, mode uh, choice. And this has been discussed in, in transportation economics. And usually you compare what is called the generalized cost. So basically what you do is that uh, uh, for transportation mode, you have two types of uh, measure. Let's say you have the financial cost, how much will it cost you? And the second term is uh, 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 what is the duration of the trip? So if you are, for example, very rich, you will pay more attention to the, the trip duration. If you don't have a lot of money, uh, you will pay attention to the cost. So you will take in, in general the cheapest uh, uh, transportation mode. Anyway, you do that. Here we will assume that everybody will uh, will basically, you know, will choose the uh, uh, as the same level of uh, uh, income. Let's say we we simplify all this, and from this you can make a calculation how many people will take uh, their car, and so you get some equation, complicated equation for a given population p. You have a certain fraction that will take the car, and you can solve this equation and. When the population is large enough, so for large cities, you will find the deceptively simple result that the number of people that will take the car is basically the population times the probability of not being close to a subway station. So this super simple result tells you that from a you know, relatively simple model tells you that basically for large cities, uh, the congestion is actually large enough so that when you have the possibility to take the subway, you will in fact choose the subway. In other words, in large cities, due to congestion, the only individuals taking the car are those who, are, who don't have, do not have access to the, the subway. And so it's, it's a super simple result because, result because it tells you that T over P, which is the fraction of people taking their car, is just one minus uh, this P, which is the probability to be close to a subway station. So then, as I said before, you know, when you write an equation, <coughs> you better test it uh, on data. And so uh, we collected data about car traffic population and uh, the bottleneck here is the probability to be at a certain distance of a subway station. So it's, a, it's the density of a subway station, so to speak. And uh, we found this at that time uh, for 25 cities in the world. And let's test this data. And here, this is what we found. So here, this is really the, the rapid transit, the, the subway density P. And this is the share, the fraction of people taking their car. And the red line is not a fit, it's the prediction you know, of this simple model. And you see that for a model, a super simple model, with no adjustable parameter, we have some excellent uh, uh, prediction. Uh, for example, I don't know, uh, look London. London, you know, there is something like 60% uh, um, uh, of individuals, they have access to a subway station. And indeed, 
the car traffic corresponds approximately to 40% of the, of the people commuting uh, uh, to the city. So, of course, you have fluctuations. You know, for example, Buenos Aires, there are many other transportation modes, you know, bicycle, and it's expensive to buy a car, etc. So, of course, you have, you know, outliers. But on average, you know, for a model with no tunable parameter, you have a very good explanation of what is going on. And in fact, uh, so this, I think this is a very nice result based on a very simple model. And this is the type of things we would like to do uh, for other quantities. And you can even push this model because with this model, you can also compute or estimate the, the quantity of gasoline used or CO2 emitted by cars, which, is, which are proportional to each other, more or less. And basically what you find is that the quantity of uh, gas uh, used is not given by the density as Newman and Kenworthy suggested, but is the product of three terms. So let me just describe uh, what are these terms? Uh, the first term is the priority not to have a public transport uh, uh, density, one minus p. So, in fact, the larger the, the the denser your network, the smaller this term. It means that, of course, if you have many many subway stations everywhere, you have less and less people taking the car, and the gas used will be smaller and smaller. Okay, that's that's a natural term. Then uh, there's the, 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 the area of the city, the size of the city. Of course, the, the larger the city, the, the larger the urban sprawl and the longer the distance, of course. And then the larger the quantity of gas uh, used, of course. And then the last term is the effect of congestion, which is the, the amount of time in addition you, you need to make for your trip due to congestion. So, I, I will not detail further, but it shows that it's absolutely not, it's not the, the newman kenworthy result, in fact. It, and uh, here we have a, 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 can I say, a simple explanation, and it also shows that, here, sorry, this is the test for the CO2 emitted. So you see that even super simple, this model gives you the reasonable trend. As usual, you have, you know, fluctuations, but that, that's okay here. But it also, this, this result tells you that first, Newman Kenworthy is a general wrong. This is not true. And in fact, if you increase the density in general, it will give an increase of the car traffic and the CO2 emission because of congestion. So what the equation here tells us is that you have to increase the density around subway station, which is the, the base, in fact, the basis of the of transit oriented uh, development. But here we have a, a quantitative basis to say that increase the density, yes, but around the, the entry points of, uh, of the subway. And so this was just to show you how a very simple model can tell you what are the important parameters. Here it's the density of public transport, the area of the, of the city, Etc. You know, uh, and this is just coming from a super simple model. So uh, let me uh, conclude with that. Uh, um, of course, I will just finish with one or two slides about what I think are, is interesting. That there, there are many challenges left. You know, for example, these are uh, some results that I like and that so far are completely unexplained. For example, the carbon footprint of cities. This. Uh, this is a paper basically by Karen Seto and collaborators. And you see that the footprint, total footprint in terms of CO2 of cities versus population. And here, you know, there's no clear trend. Well, the larger the population, the larger it seems. But the question is, can we have, a, can we have an explanation of this? You know, you have the different cities and the, the, <clears throat> the, the size of the, of, the, of the disk here is the carbon footprint per capita. So there's no clear uh, relation. And this is really an empirical study. Can we make some theory? And again, here, if you, if you can make a simple model, it, it, it very likely it will point you to the important, the critical parameters. So the parameters that are governing this. So which in turn can be helpful for policymakers. And another problem that I like also is the ener energy use in cities. 
So this is also, this is a paper by Kreuzig et al. published some years ago. And here it's the energy use in, in energy per population per capita versus GDP per capita. So people are usually plotting, you know, things versus uh, GDP. There's no, no super good reason to do that, but uh, why not, you know? And this is the type of things you, you see and uh, you have different symbols depending on different region. Uh, so it's super complicated. It's a bit difficult to interpret. And again, you know, what would be a simple model for that? And I, I believe this is where theory and simple models can help. You know, what are the relevant parameters? Can we understand uh, something in this mess? And uh, that could be helpful for cities. So with this, I will uh, stop. Thank you. I, I was a bit long, but I'm open to any question now. No worries. Um, thank you very much. This is super inspiring. Um, I think there will be two types of questions. One will be the ones that are uh, directly on some certain points. And other ones may be uh, why, you know, basically uh, questions from uh, people who come from more qualitative uh, kind of area. Yeah. Um, I, I take the privilege and, and, and ask the first question. Could you please go back to the uh, observed uh, car modal share versus rapid transport bond? This one? Yeah. Yes, this one. So uh, this is, I think it's a great example where, uh, you know, you, you use the plot to sort of like um, underscore that basically your prediction holds. Um, and as a qualitative researcher who has been in some of these places and lived in some of them, uh, one of the, like what I find really curious is like, if you look to the upper right, uh, Dallas, LA, Chicago, Boston, they're all to the left of your prediction. Uh, which, which, which sort of means that there is something going on which may be systematic. And like being familiar with Dallas in particular, which with Houston is in its own league and its own cluster, as you know, um, there is some very weird things going on with subways. On the one hand, they do this exactly what you say, uh, sort of uh, public transport related development with like uh, denser uh, rental housing around the subway stations. But then they also put a parking lot at every subway station. They put the subway into the places where most of the people live that who, you know, are upper middle class, so they will use their car anyway. And because even at the city center, there is a huge parking lot at the subway station, people will, from their own subway station, drive to that subway station, park their car, and then go to work. And so that may actually sort of systematically push that dot uh, where it doesn't belong, because the city, frankly, you know, they fig leaf wise, they actually do what you're saying, but they, they like sort of almost consciously don't care about it and actually encourage even more car traffic while doing so. So, so this kind of thing where there is obviously some qualitative reasoning that I'm doing here uh, based on some experience and what you are doing. So the question is, how can this be more systematically put together? How can we teach more and more people to read these plots so they can actually make sense of their particular data point and see what's going on, basically. The, I, I agree. I, I mean, here, I, I believe in these simple models for trends, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we, we have two, two things. We have the main uh, behavior, the trend predicted by the simple model. And then you have the fluctuations around uh, this uh, trend. And uh, these fluctuations, uh, this is where indeed, this is maybe the limit of, of models, you know, of, of simple modeling actually. And this is where indeed the, the qualitative discussion uh, takes uh, all its value, you know, and that indeed, if you know well uh, um, Dallas or Buenos Aires or Montre Montreal, you, then you, you can bring something and say, well, look, we understand why it's below and, and, and um, but, I think a general model cannot take into account all the specifics of all cities. So naturally mm -hmm. we'll have a fluctuation, but here it means that it shows that the, 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 the trend is relatively large. And so that at least the, let's say the dominant factor is indeed this, this mode of choice. That's the main, let's say the, 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 the main mechanism. And then you have all the correction around this due to specifics that you need indeed to discuss on a case uh, by case uh, uh, basis. And uh, um, so my, 
actually the the point of this result is not exactly to you know to discuss a specific city which mm -hmm. uh, which in many cases I won't be able to do. You know, I don't know all these cities in, uh, in detail, uh, but to give the trend. So at least, you know, we here, here the main result is that indeed, you know, uh, the, the, the rapid transit, uh, transit density is the main parameter here. So focus on that, et cetera, but, um, and, and, and not necessarily on the density, increasing the density at random won't be useful at all. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's really then um, it it, it would be nice, but very I don't I mean nice I, I don't know, but you know can we understand all the the fluctuations? You know, the positive fluctuation Madrid, for example, is is above. So Madrid, for example, is a, is a bad example uh, where um, you know you have eighty percent of uh, uh, of uh, rapid uh, transit density. But the car traffic is much larger than what you expect. So some people are taking, you know, uh, nonetheless the, the car, uh, um, even if they have access to, to subway. So there are, there are many reasons maybe why they don't want to do that. You know, the, the, that's possible. And on, on, the, on the left side, you know, Boston, etc. you know, it might also be that uh, uh, congestion effect becomes super important, you know, and then at a certain point you, you stop taking the car. Uh, okay, there, there, there are many, many cases, but it would be interesting to, you know, to discuss these fluctuations. Mm -hmm. Raj, uh, Mike Tom is the first question after uh, Okay, uh, yes, uh, basically, well, number one, thank you. It is it's <laughs> totally fascinating and, and, and uh, I like very much the, the, the way you are thinking about things. Uh, I have many questions, of course, and and uh, basically I probably will will do now a uh, couple of questions concerning the particulars of, of the two uh, problems you presented, and maybe then after a second round I will ask more a couple of more general ones. Uh, here, just concerning this picture, actually, it is it is very nice that it is on the screen right now. Uh, one thing I wanted to, to point out that if I understood correctly, actually your model is does have an adjustable parameter, which is basically the definition of accessibility of the, of the subway station. Yeah. So whether it is like 500 meters, so, so if it were 500 meters, all the all the points will systematically go to the left. And if you assume that it is 1.2 kilometers, it will probably go to the right. Uh, however, a related question is as follows. You, you sort of assume that it is a sharp uh, boundary, that, that there is a boundary between, between uh, there is access to public transportation or, and there is not. If there is a sort of a cost function. So, for example, people uh, which are close to the borderline, they they they, uh, uh, they uh, sort of take this cost of going additional ten minutes to the station in the account, which is. Uh, uh, compared to the cost of congestion or something, will it uh, change the, 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 the results in any meaningful way? Maybe it will lead to the, to the, uh, to, 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 to the uh, results that effective radius of accessibility is larger in, in more congested cities. And it is basically what you, what you said like, right now, explaining the Boston case. Um. Yeah, I mean, you're right. The, the parameter that defines P, a little p, is indeed a parameter. Um, although we, we didn't adjust it here. It's true that we took this definition of one kilometer. I agree it could have been, you know, 400 meters or 1.2. Um, I honestly, uh, yes, it will change the result. Or, how sensible are this, is this final? I don't know how much it will change, in fact. So it will probably depend on cities. And um, in fact, uh, there is a technical difficulty here is that this number, this data is difficult to get. And uh, so it's not super easy to get, you know, the distance uh, at, uh, let's say, varying the distance and getting the, this probability P is not a, is not a simple task. 
And in many cases, they just give you for one kilometer and that's it. And in other cases, they don't. So we had to extract it for some, from some data. So it's not, um, it's not a super uh, easy data to get. So in principle, I agree with you that um, this could change a lot. I mean, it could change. I don't know if, if it will be a big difference or not. Uh, probably it will be more sensitive in some cities and not in others. I agree. Because yeah, it's but, 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 but I, th I, I think that the, the main result should hold that it, it seems to be robust. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I interrupted. Uh, and, and my second question is about the first part. Can, can you move to the, the, to the equation? Yeah. I'm, I'm switching off the mic, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. this question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, uh, uh, we discussed the first term, and you said, well, basically, number one, uh, is beta a universal parameter, or is it, is, is it the same for each city, and what are the values? And, and, and... Yes, so the... Um, uh, basically, the, the exponent here, this, this kind of exponent beta, is uh, changing for uh, is different for all the countries that we studied. It's, mm -hmm. it's close to one, but varies between uh, just uh, um, as far as I remember between zero point five and one. So it's less than one, but mm -hmm. it varies. And the exponent of the Levy noise is also varying between. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's less than uh, one and uh, no sorry it's it's of order one point something in general between one and one point four. We, I have to check the paper again, but. Uh, uh, it's definitely not um, universal. So these things depend on the country. Okay, and uh, and once again, is uh, the levy noise uncorrelated in time? Uh, yes, we checked that, and uh, yes, it is. Yes, uh, uh, I mean uh, in, in the approximation we have here, uh, remember that we don't have a super long. I mean, the data is over ten or twenty years, you know. So. <laughs> Uh, on what we could check, we didn't see correlations. Now we have to test on longer uh, times, but we, with, with the data we got, the assumption that it is uncorrelated is uh, supported by the data. Okay, okay. So, so basically, just to, 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 to be clear, I, I just made a back end of the envelope calculation while, while you were talking. Uh, if you compare Montpellier with Saint Etienne, just two or two examples of basically top 10 cities with very different dynamics in the last 50 years. Uh, the, the growth rate is consistently different by at least 2% per year, which is which is number one huge, and number two, it is, I mean, it 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 it, it holds for 50 years. Uh, so, but but probably you cannot see it if you look at it at uh, well this sort of long range things if you look at ten year data. So, so it's probably not a random thing, and we sort of understand if if well if, even me, uh, me from my knowledge what Saint Etienne and uh, Montpellier is sort of understand why it is the, the, this difference. But. Yeah, I I think you know it's it's this model actually reproduces the. The statistical properties of the set of uh, cities, let's say, so mm -hmm. um, uh, including so this sort of zip flow and the dynamics, so it reproduces the the statistical properties, uh, uh, dynamical properties. So we, you know, we test this kind of thing, the priority to have a, a, a you know, the, the priority to have a, a, a variation, a rank variation, etc. Mm -hmm. So of course. It doesn't say much about particular event. Mm -hmm. you know, if you take now to compare two different cities, um, I, you know, this will depend. I mean, it's, it's all the difference between, uh, let's say, a statistical description, which is valid for the set of cities, and then making a prediction for a specific city. This, mm -hmm. I think, is the, is the limit of this equation. I cannot mm -hmm. make the prediction of a specific city. Yeah, well, it, it's a random equation, yes. Yes, yes. Now, what it tells you is that if you want to change a city, you have to, there's only one thing is to, you have to change is that attractivity. And this can seriously change. It's not just a, you know, there's, 
in fact, what this equation tells you is that you have some, you know, background, you know, growth background, which is just, you know, the, the demographic growth. And this is the, 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 the noisy background, which is more or less the same for all cities. And then, you know, what makes the difference really that the city becomes number one, number two, or whatever, are these interurban migration. And um, of course, uh, what you know, what controls this uh, this interurban migration is out of the scope of this equation. It's it's just uh, we are describing this by a levy noise. So it means that sometimes you have huge huge number of people. You know, if I think about you know an extreme case is the is the gold rush in San Francisco. You know, in mm -hmm. in 1850 or something. You know, suddenly the population. You know was multiplied by thousand because you know all these guys were coming to to digging for gold and and these are you know this kind of external event uh, um, which are uh, exogenous event would say an economist you know which are driven by the in new industry for example you know you, it, it attracts many workers etc and, and we describe the statistics but we are unable with this equation to explain why it is so yeah, I, I totally, uh, well, I, I think it's very appealing idea and, 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 and I agree with that. Uh, the only thing I'm a little bit worried about is that these uh, random events are so concentrated in time. So, so they don't have, uh, in, in your formulation, don't have some aftershock in time after that. But anyway, maybe it is, uh, we're, we're yeah. taking much time and probably should give uh, time to other people. Yes, Mark. No. Thank you for, for the presentation. No, I, I wanted to tell you a couple of things. One is that Madrid doesn't, uh, it doesn't, it goes out of the outlier because their system of sharing is, very, Madrid is a very radial city and, and the sharing is only in the center part. Means everyone that actually lives in the, in the outskirts of the city, it used the, it used the, um, the, the private car. And then the other thing I was thinking, did you consider to, to calculate how much is the, um, the price of the transportation? Because I know I had the last six months, I was in, in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong, I think the reason why everyone is using the public transport is also because it's very cheap um, compared to, for example, taking the car will, cons will, will mean that you will need to pay a very expensive uh, parking. And it's not only the paying the, the, the petrol, but it's also paying the parking. While the, the public transportation is very cheap, but absolutely very cheap. In, in London, I was looking because I kind of like remember, like for example, subway is underused because their price is high for many people. Uh, there is some, some articles talking about this, um, that the, the subway had been declining on, on use because of the, of the prices. People take the, the buses because it's cheaper. Means uh, the density is also a factor that can be uh, affected by the variable of the price. The, um, look, the, the, I think the point um, the point of the the model is to you know to extract the important uh, mechanism. It doesn't mean that there are it, it, these are the only one. You know, of course. No, no, I know, I know. Yeah, have many variation and 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 Madrid actually is a bit strange because it, it, from our data, uh, still uh, um, almost eighty percent of the people have access to uh, to uh, to uh, a rapid transit uh, density mode. So that's a bit. Uh, so you see, it's it's strange. It's yes, it's almost 80%. So it seems that naively what I would have said, you know, uh, about Madrid is that uh, people have access to uh, uh, transit density, but they don't take, they, they prefer to take the car. This is what naively I would have said, um, but uh, you know, there, there's maybe something that I don't understand. Uh, more generally, and this is the second part of your, your question. I mean, the, the mode choice, is a, is a is an important and complicated problem. Is that uh, if you have uh, think of the simple situation, you have uh, either mode one, let's say the car, or the subway, then uh, uh, many factors will uh, will come into play in favor of one or the other one. 
some people, for example, hate to, to be with other people or whatever. They want to, you know, to be, you know, quiet in their car and they, 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 they just hate walking or things like that, you know. So there are, there are in fact, many factors for the, for the uh, modal choice. This has been discussed a lot in the literature. And, the, the and how you decide which, like I, I understand that you, you're trying to do as simple as possible model, no, that is your point. Uh, by the way, I am from Barcelona and it's really nice that it's in the line. Um, uh, yeah, that how you decide, because I understand that you are not uh, making, you're not trying all the possibilities. You are trying to beforehand to save your time and, and do it simple since the beginning. How, how you decide uh, which uh, variables are more important? No, no, it's true. No, the, the, the classical thing, let's say, to compare to transportation mode, is using this generalized cost. And the generalized cost in transport economics is the sum of two terms. For a transport mode, you have the financial cost. So for, for, for the subway, it's, the, it's the, the ticket, the cost of the ticket. For a car, is the cost of the car insurance, et cetera, divided by the number of days, but whatever, it's the, how much it costs you. And the second term in this cost, so you have financial cost plus another term, which is the, the, the duration of the trip, basically. And the prefactor, if you want the detail, is called the value of time. So if the value of time is super large, it means that what is important for you in your cost is the duration of the trip. If you have a very small value of time, the most important thing for you is the financial cost. Anyway, in general, your financial cost plus, let's say, trip duration, and this is the quantity that you compare for the two modes. And in general, you will choose the mode with the smallest cost, smallest total cost. So it's really the interplay between financial and time. And this is, this is the discussion about, you know, subway versus car, is that the, the subway is, is, is in general uh, much cheaper. Uh, and in addition, in big cities, there's a lot of congestion, so it's also faster. So in fact, in large cities, everybody basically should take the subway when you have access to the subway because it's cheaper and faster. Of course, uh, uh, some uh, people, when you don't have access to the subway, that's okay, you cannot take it. And in some cases, some people really hate the subway because it's dirty, it's unsafe, it's, you know, for many reasons, then of course you have small fluctuation and these are the factors that are difficult to put, you know, in a model. There are many studies, you know, people trying to do some econometric studies to exhibit the important parameters in, in, your, in your modal choice. Why do you take the car, even if you have access to the subway, etc. This is a difficult discussion. But here we have basically the two parameters, which is really how much it costs you and what's the time of the trip, you know, which are the two main parameters. And this, uh, this result that I'm showing here uh, results from this. There are no other parameters. So indeed, uh, uh, you know, if you see, you know, uh, uh, discrepancies, they can in part come from, from what you mentioned. I mean, some, for some reasons, people still want to take their car or, you know, whatever. And then of course this is not, a, but this is a very important and interesting discussion, especially, you know, for a lot of cities, what, what determines the modal choice, you know, and, and beyond, and we know that beyond cost and duration, there are other factors that are important. And, and, and we saw that in, in during the pandemic, actually, the COVID pandemic, people were uh, afraid of getting the virus in public transportation. So they came back to the car. And in most large cities, we saw the car traffic jumping, you know, and, uh, and the share in public transportation decreasing, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, this was well, a terrible, uh, terrible fact for the public transportation in cities. Well, in fact, they actually came back to, to bike too. Uh, at least that's what I know, that the bikes even became more expensive. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Okay, depends on the city, etc. But in, in general, you know, car traffic stayed uh, relatively high. Even if the number of commuters was smaller, so that's that. You know, but bike is a good thing. But they have a. But the same, you know, for the modal choice, for example, the bike. There is a super important parameter, which is the safety. You know, and many people, 
you know, this is why you, many people discuss about bikeability of a city and, and you have to, you know, build protected lanes, etc. And this will probably will even increase, you know, the fraction of people taking the bike. But you, you, you see here that indeed it's an example where this safety parameter is a bit difficult to take into account in the model, of course. Thank you. Mila Weber. Yeah, now I'm, I'm hesitating because actually Mar took my, my question. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for a really interesting presentation. And uh, my background is in cultural history. So I'm, I'm coming from the uh, deep, deep uh, qualitative uh, methods and, and so on. So actually, uh, I could maybe continue from, from the discussion you had with Mar uh, concerning the uh, choice of parameters and and uh, and I understand that uh, based on your presentation that you are really focusing on on this kind of um, using the smallest possible number of parameters and and getting these kinds of like over, overall um, uh, maybe explanations of of um, how for instance traffic functions and and kind of like um, and so on but I I just wanted to maybe ask. Um, Kind of as you as you all also said that um, you know we can learn some things based on on the kind of like the uh, simple uh, method, but then kind of like it's uh, more difficult to understand maybe more nuanced uh, ways people, for instance, use the public transportation. Um, so, is there a way you would um, uh, kind of um, to jump? So first, if you do this kind of like um, like a, mm, very simple method or, or simple model, so is there a way then to go in deeper into some some details if we if we know based uh, on on some interviews or or some kind of like uh, questionnaires that. Um, that you know some some po some parts of population use the transportation in different ways, and kind of like to more uh, to understand more of the nuances of of this usage. So kind right. of like, is there a way to go from this big um, uh, this overarching model to kind of like more nuanced uh, understandings? Thanks. The, the yes, thank you. The um, uh, ab absolutely. I mean the. And here, it's, it's also, again, indeed, in, in this mode uh, choice, you know, the question is really, is really, or oh, do the individual choose a transportation mode? And, and here, all, the, um, all this little model is based on the discussion, you know, um, that takes into account the financial cost and the trip duration. But you could think of something else, for example, if you have data about the feeling of the safety feeling, for example, in some in some cities, probably people don't take the, the subway because they feel that it's it's not so safe, etc. You know, then you could, in this model, introduce this this uh, safety feeling, for example, and and recompute stuff, and you will probably have a correction to this result, uh, that and it will modify a bit the result. So. It's, it's relatively easy because here the main ingredient again is this uh, is this modal choice uh, that you can you know uh, model as you like. So if you have some data in a city, for example, you have surveys that tells you that I don't know uh, uh, thirty percent of the people don't take the subway because it's dirty or and unsafe. Uh, this is something we could include in the model and see if indeed it it, it works out and we can explain the fluctuation. That actually, that would be fun to do, you know, uh, uh, exploring a bit, you know, this uh, this uh, uh, mode choice. Um, then, of course, you need you need the data, but we always have more data. But that would be fun to explore, indeed. Thank you very much. Um, I got sort of a question uh, that is sort of bridging these two things, uh, which is, um, you know, I did this thing on um, sort of cultural migration where people move from their birth to their death location. And there, if you look at birth, um, the interesting thing is that uh, you, you basically recovered a kind of more or less uh, tip distribution, uh, but the assumption is that this is sort of like um, 
you know, sort of the same as the as the population distribution. While uh, the place you move to, because you're a symphony conductor and obviously have to move to a place where there's a symphony orchestra, um, there that that is sort of a difference. And it turns even it turns out that there is over centuries. Uh, the slope actually changes, um, so there is there seems to be some concentration towards more attractive places going on. But now here's where I want to get to. Like if you go back to your uh, cartoon picture of the you know city I, city J, and the um, um, and the and the sort of system level, yeah, exactly this. So now one interesting thing is that um, all of these uh, interrelations are uh, special in two ways. One is uh, they are, there is no, uh, and please excuse the fact that PhD is in art history, there is no detailed balance. So basically moving in and moving out is not the same thing and moving out does not imply that you return. So what does it, what do I mean with this? Like for example, you have one uh, parameter for your levy chunk, which can either be positive or negative. But if you look at cities like New York City, which at the same time acted as major attractors because they were the entrance point for the immigrants from Europe, while at the same time they also were major hubs sending out people across the US. One can basically uh, imagine that you know, there's, there's two different sort of uh, parameters going on because uh, in order, as in Europe, you would move to New York and it would appear as this like super attractive place and then you would try to make it there and once you make it there, you from here, say, reading the newspaper, you hear there's stuff going on in the US, and then you will move out. So it's not the same thing. It's not either moving in or out. You move in and out at the same time, and it's different functions. And so this kind of things uh, are, are, are sort of, I think, um, not in the same realm as what we were talking before, a particular subway station or a particular uh, specific of, of certain city. but they could theoretically be within the scope of a sort of like general summary statistics model because they're basically pretty general. So that, that would be question number one if you, if you agree that this would make sense to actually extend the model like this. And then I would like to bring in a second topic, which is interesting, which is the other term where you say, okay, it's pure growth, um, like in your natural growth term. Now, one of the interesting things, it's very interesting you say that you have a 20 year duration. And I think the original rent clock paper has a little longer time, but it's also not that long. But one thing that appears in, if you look at like this migration of noted people over centuries, if you're the order of three or four or five centuries, it's, it's almost always the slope of the city changes super radically. And then it's really a change of fitness. Like, let me give you one example. Munich was declared a kingdom, not out of God's grace, but of Napoleon's grace, of course, uh, in 1830. And from that moment onward, the slope changes and it's basically in synchrony with Paris. It was a little smaller, but it grows like crazy. And then like Paris sort of changes slope, but Munich sort of is coupled with Berlin and keeps on growing. And so these kind of things where you have these massively exogenous shocks that change the nature of the city that actually can lead to sort of differences in your first term, the growth term changes. And these are not random, but there is, there's definitely something going on. Uh, you know, Fernando Rodel would say, you know, Barcelona is at the sea, but it will never change and that makes it attractive. <laughs> and so there is other things where, you know, things that can change, like in, in, in Naples, the Vesuvius can sort of have a heavy eruption and definitely this will cut a dent into Naples for a couple of centuries, I guess. So that, that is sort of something which, which I think um, boils down to the question, your two parameters there, do you think there is, it is possible to do sensible ex extensions of your models um, without sort of like having a sort of like, you know, you, you can throw the argument that there's like, okay, that's detailed discussion and specific and it's only applying to your research or something like that. No, but the, um, okay, I, 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 okay, you, you tell me if I understood uh, correctly, but uh, um, first, uh, I would like to mention that the inter-urban migration term <laughs> is zero on average. So on average, yeah. you basically have as many people that are going out that are coming in. Yes. On average. And in fact, 
this actually might uh, be the reason. So this term on average is zero. So yes. in, fact, in fact, if you so if you look quickly, since on average it's zero, it means that the, there's some on average detailed, uh, there is some balance on average, yeah. not, a, not a detailed balance, I agree, but on average, there's some balance in and out. And it would be even tempting to say, well, let's forget about this term. It's only the growth term that is important. And on average, it gives you this kind of Gibra model. And, and in fact, this is maybe why historically we we, you know, we applied the Gibra model and Gabet <laughs> model was not uh, working, not so bad, etc. Because the second term is zero on average. The interesting thing is that it's it's only about fluctuations and fluctuations that can be super large. <laughs> so it's at a certain point, uh, 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 the the uh, all the people are going away or, or or are coming to this place because there is a new industry, for example. You know. Yeah. Uh, or, or some, you know, or the, or for example, in the U.S., that was very common. You know, the the mines were closing. For example, there was nothing to dig anymore, and and so all the people went away or were attracted in the first place. You know, such as the gold rush. Or but we have we have hundreds of examples like that. You know, where the the city, uh, its trajectory, so to speak, was completely modified because of some uh, activity. So mm -hmm. um, I I've, I've so I think that. You know, in terms of descriptive, and so that's the first point. The other point is that we tested, uh, when I say we only have 10 or 20 years of data, I meant the inter-urban data. Mm -hmm. so, you know, how many, the count of how many people are moving from city I to city J. Okay, yeah. This is, this is the data that is difficult to find. Now, we tested the, this equation over 200 years of data because the population of cities, this is something you have, you know, well, for, for 200 years easily in Europe or in, in, uh, in France, for instance, or in the US. So yeah. the dynamics, when I was showing, uh, 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 you know, showing this, this, this was the rank clock, but um, maybe more, let me see this. For example, this is the typical time, the number of year to see uh, uh, some rank variation. Mm -hmm. So here we looked in France, we have more than 100 years of data. So you just look the ranks of, of the cities and this is something easy to get. And then uh, what we showed here is that uh, the, the, the standard model are unable to, to, to predict, to reproduce the large variation. You know, you, you see, for example, in France here, uh, over one century, this is what it means here, over one century, one of the years, some cities have seen their rank variation equal to 300. So they were yeah. basically, you know, number yeah. 100 and become 100, you know? So they, it's a huge change, you know? And so I, I, I don't have specific example here, but, you know, it means that some cities completely change, I mean, drastically because of some fluctuation that, you know, uh, uh, either a loss or gain of some people. So it's really, it's really not about the average, it, it's, everything about fluctuations, which are yeah. very specific events uh, due to reason that are exogenous. Actually, you know, what is missing in this model, I would say, is that, uh, can you explain, do you have a simple model related to um, activity economy or something like that, that could explain the statistics of inter-urban migration? You know, that, that's yes. interesting, you know? That, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is what we did there in, in 2014, and, and it seems to hold. So the idea is obviously you look at like what we did is we looked at the uh, sort of noted people, um, which don't need to be famous because then you lose several orders of magnitude of how many people you have. Uh, and you just look at like where they move, where they move out and where they move in. And it turns out that like, even if you have very, very little data, like for example, say pick a neighborhood of Berlin, and you get two data points, either moving in or out. If they move in, this is an attractive place. Even today, if they move out, it's still a shitty place. And so it's, it's, it's sort of like they're like particles that swim on soap water. And then you can see where it's flowing, basically. And one of the interesting things there is that, indeed, you find places like we. So you can do a simple um, sort of you just, you know, it's a scatter plot of birth and death share, basically. Um, and then basically you get this sort of like log log, uh, you know, sort of whatever square root deviation, whatever you want to see. 
And there is places like Hollywood, which take in 10 times as many people as, uh, like nobody's born in Hollywood, basically is what I'm saying. And on the other hand, there is places where people like systematically move out, which is not necessarily bad. So obviously people move out, like for example, um, people move out of uh, um, the Russian spelling of, 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 of Tbilisi and they move into the, obviously this means like Russians move away and Georgians move to, to, to Tiflis or Tbilisi. And um, then there's other places where this is not uh, explained the same way, like, for example, Boston or Hamburg, people move out. Why is that the reason? It's because, obviously, Hamburg is a port city, so if you get famous in Hamburg, you move out uh, and die somewhere else. And in Boston, you know, as you know, uh, there's all these PhDs and postdocs going on since, like, 150 years who, while being there, have kids and then move out. And, and, and get famous somewhere else. And so there, it's, it's very difficult to interpret. Again, you can very clearly, very quickly go to your subway station level <laughs> of a particular subway station neighborhood. But indeed, you can see these like vast differences that there's places where people only move in and people uh, and places where people only move out. And I think you're right, in most cases, like Vienna is a good example, has a major sales loop. Like, there's a lot of people in Vienna who got famous over time, actually came out of Vienna itself. Um, so obviously there is a zero, you know, you could say first order approximation, your model very much will hold, but I think it would actually make sense to include these kind of imbalances because um, particularly if you look at the system level of the United States or the system level in Europe, you will actually see that these kind of imbalances make sense because they characterize particular cities in really, really interesting ways. Like academic cities are attractors, harbor cities are repellers, and so on. So it's a really interesting thing. Mm, okay, the, I agree with you. We, we didn't look at this detail because we, we just checked the statistics and, and, and yeah. that basically, on average, though, I mean, if you think about Boston, you know, on average over a few years, because you you don't always have more of a, a yearly, you know, uh, uh, you, you look at T and T plus something, you know, or, <laughs> or anyway. So then on average, you know, many students are coming in, some others are coming out. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Roughly, yeah. roughly, the population, you know, varies due to the, uh, let's say, national uh, birth minus death uh, rate, typically. Mm -hmm. you know? And so, and you don't see even the change because the in is approximately equal to the out. But uh, it's true that there's some turnover of the population that is not uh, that is not trivial. But mm -hmm. here we have the count only of the total count of people. So, uh, but I agree that the next step anyway would be to include, you know, some um, some attractivity uh, of cities, you know, and how could we, you know, reproduce the statistic from a more microscopic point of view with uh, attractivity or, or repulsiveness of, mm -hmm. of cities? Yes, I agree totally. Yes, yes. If you, if you have one publication on this, what you do, send, send me the send me the reference. I, I'm happy to. Yes. Oh, oh. Okay. Uh, Mike. Uh, okay. Well, so so basically, I wanted to um, address uh, to, to to ask you about well, basically two more general questions. One is related to uh, to what Max was just uh, speaking about. Uh, but I will start with another one, which is um, basically uh, I see that the, well, in, 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 in many cases you, you compare your uh, predictions naturally with, with the data and, and whenever you look at the data you should define what exactly the city is and what exactly the city population is. And as you obviously know, it is a very vague concept. For example, I've seen in your mm, uh, uh, last figure there was uh, Guangzhou this with population 45 million. And I think if you look at, at different uh, 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 literature, you, will, you can have any number from basically 14 to 65 million. Uh, so, so do you have any any? Um, general policy in how you you how you define the city and what sort of uh, population figures you use, etc. Um, uh, yes, I have a general policy for that. Uh, I use when it's possible the urban area data. 
or so depending on the country you, you, you have different definition for the US it's the it's the metropolitan statistical area in the OECD it's the functional urban area etc so when it's possible it's not always possible I, uh, I I use this broader definition which is not the administrative definition which is the, the broader sense it's not perfect of course but data is not perfect but the, the I, I always use this when it's possible so uh, but I agree that at a certain point you know there are some uh, even in these definitions, there are some, you know, some parameters that you could modify and change. Uh, uh, again, it's not perfect, but I think it's, it, it makes much more sense than uh, the administrative uh, definition. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, and, and you see, basically, I think that uh, OECD data is more or less self-consistent. Yes. That's, yes, that's the nice thing is that at least we have the same definition and uh, so it's it, that's nice unfortunately you know that's that's terrible because you know geographer they know this problem for you know i don't know for decades i, I you know these are the discussion with mike or, or denis Pumin in france that we have for years and 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 you know and the international union of geographers they couldn't you know impose some general definition you know that would be nice you know let's let's adopt the standard you know for cities come on and but this this doesn't exist you know it's 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 even worse i think in china where in some cases you aggregate some province etc so the the population data in china is a nightmare because there are there are thousands of definitions so uh, it, it, it's really terrible you know and and it's of course it's a it's a major problem in all this uh, uh, urban science because there's no general agreement uh, on on what on the definition of a city so it, it's terrible mm -hmm. and i think there are at least a couple of of uh, sort of can we stay on the topic for a second yes uh, okay yeah well i'm i'm sorry okay. about the topic okay that, that there are uh, i think uh, city population the dot de and Demographia.com, they also try to, 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 to do sort of uh, uh, worldwide uh, self-consistent definition of cities by, by looking at, 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 at a very granular level of what to include, what to exclude. And well, I'm not sure which one is better, but, but I, I'm no. aware that there are several efforts to, 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 to make sort of self-consistent no, lists, so to speak. Yeah. I like the paper by Rosenfeld and Max, etc. Some years ago, uh, they they take the definition of the city as the as the giant component of the percolation cluster of the built area. So nice. Not, not <laughs> this definition, which I like, which is you can use you can get from uh, remote sensing, for example, and this gives you a non-ambiguous definition. So, uh, but you know, and and you know, if I had a dream, you know, this would be, you know, so we, we make a measure of cities <laughs> as the giant component, and then you know, we could make uh, some homogeneous measures. But <laughs> so, uh, with remote sensing, I mean, we we always have more remote sensing data. So now you know, we have uh, almost twenty years of remote sensing, um, uh, machine learning can extract relatively easily the built areas so machine learning is able to distinguish you know buildings from non-buildings let's say and roads from buildings etc so you can really construct now for many many uh, urban areas you can construct the, the, this giant component this connected cluster and um, so i mean this this might be a way in the future to study many different cities i mean indian chinese Mm, um, of American cities on the same foot, you know, that that this is probably something we'll do very soon in the future. So I'd like to stay in this topic for a second, uh, which is, um, so I think I fully agree with you. I think the remote sensing part is awesome and the giant connecting component of the percolation cluster is even more awesome if you could get that, if you have the mobility data to do so. But um, there is one thing that won't go away, which is historically, <laughs> Our data is not that good, and we need to sort of like appreciate the fact there's U.S. counties which for a century have been open polygons at, until they find oil in the middle and then they determine the boundary. There's other urban, uh, there's other counties that move 100 miles across the map because, I don't know, the priest decides to move the village. And um, then there is things where it's not clear 
like, you know, New York City, what does it even mean at different times? Um, is a place, uh, do we want to have the area? If you don't have the area, like the way how historically I've so far dealt with this is basically I just take whatever I get. So if I get consistently 35,000 toponyms with a number attached, that's it. And then I don't care about the space. Um, but ideally, I would like to have what you have. But so how do we deal with this? Like, how do we actually, how can we make sense of history in places where, you know, for obvious reasons, there won't be any cell phone call detail records, no subway tickets, and there will definitely be no remote sensing about what's going on. So how do we deal with this? How can we, do you have any idea how we bring this together without having a peer review battle? <laughs> no, well, I, I, you know, for example, um, you know, concerning New York City, we have a nice, uh, database of the historical evolution of uh, Manhattan growing, you know, <laughs> there are many, um, um, uh, so, so you, we, we always have more and more uh, historical data, which is digitalized. Uh -huh. I think the public library in New York is, you know, uh, puts a lot of effort of, for digitalizing historical maps and historical data. And um, so in some cases we can have a, a pretty good uh, historical view. Now, um, in general, no, the, the cause is, is lost. I mean, uh, it, it, but if you, you know, I again, I think depending on your specific research question, uh, we can always find some data, which is not perfect again, uh, but um, there are many things we can do. And again, if you're interested in New York City, I think there's a pretty good data set about uh, uh, the spatial evolution of uh, uh, of uh, uh, of Manhattan, then the other uh, uh, boroughs, etc. So yeah. um, uh, I, I think we can. I mean, it's but it, it's a it's a um, case by case basis. You know, it's it's not it, it's not general, and we have to uh, we have to adapt to the data we can get. I, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> I, I brought the example because historically, according to census.gov, New York City is, uh, you know, among the top 100 places in the U.S. First, there is Brooklyn, Manhattan, and, you know, Queens, whatever. And then at some point, they just, like, accumulate the point, and then it's New York City, that so obviously jumps to, like, you know, top three. And But but then, you know, there's no comparison possible because there's three dots that are not there anymore, and there's another one that is, al is already there. And the three dots that were there before are not what is New York City because there may be other parts of New York City in there and stuff like that. So I hear you. So basically, the idea is this case by case, and uh, we will still struggle there. Uh, but if I, the take home I think is is correct that like obviously we should push the European Union to digitize more historical data <laughs> because yeah. it will be better for all of us. Yeah, yeah, and I think there are some efforts, you know, some some uh, European grants and things like that. There are some projects and. Uh, and yeah. uh, um, I know some local project in, in France, in Paris, you know, most of the, there are many projects about uh, digitalizing, you know, all the, the stuff we have in the, the national uh, uh, library. And uh, um, of course, there, there's so much data that you have to think about how to digitalize this, you know, so some collective, uh, actually the New York uh, Public Library effort was nice because they proposed the tool uh, accessible on the internet and everybody could you know make his own digitalization so a, a little bit like open street map you know where uh, yeah. individual people can uh, make their own uh, digitalization let's say but then of course you need to you need tools that can correct some mistake etc and this is what the, the the new york public library did and they, they had a huge success they opened online some data and so you could go there whoever you are, not scientist, but everybody. And, and you could choose, oh, I want to uh, digitalize this little part of the map, you know, and uh, of the cadaster or whatever. And, 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 and then of course you need the right tools, but you know, it was very graphical and simple to use. And then you multiply, you imagine you, that there are something like, I don't know, 100,000 people yeah. the first weekend. And, and this, of course, you know, when you compare to the 10 researcher, you know, you, you multiply by 1,000 or more, 10,000, the, the capacity, uh, the digitalization capacity. And so th these collective projects are really nice because we can, you can really accelerate. The data is there. You just have, you need manpower uh, to, uh, to digitalize it, in fact. 
and uh, and you know I saw we we had the we digitalized the the Cassini map which was one of the first French uh, national map which mm -hmm. actually it's it's a whole story this Cassini map but it took us you know we were what uh, 20 researchers it it took us years you know you, we, you, you had a little fragment, you know, and then you digitize, oh, this is a river, this is a little village and so, you know, and, and it took forever. So um, this is really, uh, you know, if, you're, if we are interested in the time evolution, which is where, where the fun is, I believe, but uh, uh, we need to digitalize this data, which exists for any country, and, mm -hmm. and, but you need the manpower and, and a way to do that more quickly because at this rate we will be all retired, you know. <laughs> second question from Mike. Yeah, yeah. Uh, second question, which is basically sort of an open ended thing. Uh, in, uh, and it is related to what uh, Max have done with, with this uh, famous people, death and birthplaces. Are you aware of? Uh, any, and, and it is related to what we, we sort of doing now here with, with studying the mention of places in, in use, basically. Uh, do you know of any, any, any models or, or any, any research related to measuring and explaining the cultural importance of cities? Um, um, I, I don't think so, no. And actually the, uh, no, the quantitative uh, analysis, of course, I, I, I read a few, you know, there, there are of course many books and many studies and in history, archeology, span et cetera, about, you know, the first cities or they evolved, et cetera, you know, the functional <laughs> cities and many things, uh, but um, nothing quantitative actually. So, uh, and I think this is really, uh, this is really, uh, and, and even cities actually disappearing, you know, I, I you know, the, the collapse of some cities, I think uh -huh. it's also an interesting uh, mm -hmm. case. And uh, no, no, I would be thrilled to see some studies uh, uh, about that. I, I, I don't know where to get the data. Uh, I, I don't know what data, actually, but, uh, but I don't know, no. I, um, what was studied a bit more quantitatively is the urban expansion. So there was this, uh, the Chicago group, uh, mainly driven by a guy uh, called um, Shlomo Angel. And, and this is the Chicago school. And they, they, they published something that they called the Atlas of Urban Expansion. And uh, so they tried to construct some data um, over two, three centuries for many, many different cities, 30 or 40 cities in the world. And, uh, but again, these are on very simple indicators, area, population, density, uh, you know, but nothing more. And, and, and uh, um, but the, some so, cultural aspect, uh, uh, no, I, I, okay. This, this is something I never saw from the quantitative point of view. Actually. So there's a related uh, question. So like I had a, uh, so this, this noted people thing, the thing in the background, the state of the art before was that historically, people use this Tertius Chandler estimation. So there's this guy called Tertius Chandler who wrote a 678 page type of script where even the line uh, distances is not constant, where he just wrote down for every city, uh, how large it is at a given time and what's the source he has this information from. And he so systematically overestimates Indian and, and Chinese cities versus other places. But one of the weird things is that this becomes like this canonical data set over 20 years and like the Santa Fe people did a lot of stuff with that kind of data. And uh, you, you have this famous um, exponential with a parallel tail thing going on, which is due to the fact that small places are actually aggregated into the large places. And obviously then this gives you this different distribution. And obviously it's one person who also, Tertius Gendler, the, the second uh, famous fact about his life is he believed in real, uh, in the Greek pantheon. So he wanted to reestablish the religion of Zeus and Athena and stuff. So there is, there is a credibility question about like all this, like, uh, you know, sort of it's, it's a kind of layman's verb. Um, and now one of the interesting things that there is, is basically um, there is this Tertius Chandler data. There is data, which in, in our case, the noted people, they're not the population. There's something that correlates with that. 
And you, the stuff you are looking at is sort of like the largest places, but there is a significant portion of the distribution missing, which is all the small places, right? It's a little bit like in the, in the size distribution of wars, where you have Richardson, there's all the wars, and then there's another paper by Closet about all the terrorist attacks, but actually you would love to have a sort of like cross-cutting uh, distribution, like where you have all the small places. In Punjab, for example, there's large cities, but there's many small places. You can only understand the system as a whole with the small places in, in there too, even though they may be their own giant connected components. And so do you have any thoughts about this, like sort of, uh, you know, depends on how you see it, the, the, the other end of the distribution? Um, where all the small stuff is, uh, which may be governing what's actually going on in the system, isn't it? it yes, well, I agree that it, it could in some way, uh, 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 can I say, uh, feed the system, you know, starting from smaller cities. Mm -hmm. But actually, the, the smaller times, you know, of cities, this is, again, it's not super well known because of the lack of data. I mean, the People mostly, what I know, studied, you know, the historical evolution of the, of the, of the population, you know, and the zip plot. For example, you know, if I, uh, I don't know if I uh, let me, uh, you know, you know, you probably know, maybe I have, uh, there here, yes, maybe you know, yes, these are different plots that could, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, for example, this is what uh, uh, Mike did in his uh, paper. Yeah. You know, this is. Resolution is bad, but you know, again, this is the wrong clock, you know, over um, to more than 2000 years, you know, this was in his nature paper. And, yeah. uh, um, uh, you know, this is okay, this is maybe a bit difficult to, uh, I don't know, to, to understand and to extract something more. But you know what, for example, I, I'm uh, another study, you know, and the time variation. Uh, yes, this is, for example, uh, this is from Zipf book, you know, and this is actually I found it interesting because this is the the Zipf plot, and so again in the Zipf plot you you have the world distribution of cities. You don't have only the largest one. You mm -hmm. have the, the large rank correspond to the smaller cities, and here uh, Zipf noticed the thing, so he constructed the the Zipf plot, so population versus rank, and here it's over uh, 150 years or so. And he noticed that, so it starts in 1790 up to 1930, and it takes all communities more with more than 2,500. So, I mean, so, so we have small stuff here. And uh, uh, what is interesting is that during the war, the civil war, you know, you have, you, have, uh, 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 you know, things are happening. So actually, this is what Zip said, he said, Oh, uh, uh, here in 1840, 30, 20, the plot is not nice. And this is probably, and he, he writes it like that in his book, a sign of intranational instability. So the fact that, you know, people due to the war, of course, are, I mean, it's a bad time to speak about that, but are moving from one city to the other one, you know, leads to this uh, uh, strange uh, fluctuations and mm -hmm. uh, uh, including smaller cities, you know, and, and uh, so it's really, uh, the rank goes up to 1000 and, you know, at the beginning. So uh, um, I, there are some studies like that, you know, Mike looked a little bit also the rank clocks over a larger uh, period, but uh, uh, so maybe there's something we can say, you know, we have the data actually uh, uh, for the US in population, you know, can we say something more about, you know, smaller cities who, who mm -hmm. subsequently and, and probably, you know, I guess that there are, there are things uh, hidden in the, in the US population data set. Uh, probably we could extract, uh, you know, interesting things. Um, mm -hmm. at, at a more global level, I don't know. But again, I, I believe that, you know, uh, 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 successful cities, for example, uh, cities who were first uh, villages and, and grew, you know, there's this whole evolution from a small village, let's say, to a large city that is, uh, I, I guess, qualitatively well described and by, by historians and uh, uh, archeologists, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, but um, from a quantitative point of view, it's much more open, I believe. I mean, there are <laughs> so many things. Okay, last question, Milo Eva. 
Yes, uh, I must say, I really enjoyed this conversation in, in general. Um, yeah, my, my question is very simple and it maybe arises from the fact that in different disciplines we have different research interests. So I, I was curious when you were talking about your first example of this uh, kind of like uh, populations, the city populations. So um, how would you explain to uh, somebody in the humanities, for instance, that why there is need to calculate the dynamics of, of city growth? And, and what, what do we actually learn when we have the equation? And, you know, uh, so, so is there, a, are you kind of like, um, does it mean that then we can do predictions of, of future city growth or, or, or I don't know, fulfill the missing data or, or some other kinds of like means of what, when we have this, when we're able to? Uh, calculate this. So, 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 what? What, what is the the next step? Thanks. Well, the, thank you. Yes, I um, um, I understand your question. The okay, okay, I have two parts in my answer. The first part is uh, uh, because it's fun, and uh, <laughs> when when you like data <laughs> and mathematics, and you know, it's fun writing an equation that describes the data. <laughs> so <laughs> then, the, the the second part, more seriously, is it useful or not? Um, I would say not not always, but you, who knows? You know, uh, here here at least we understood. You know, for the city stuff, we understood that the main driver of the rank of a city in a country is not demographic growth, is basically interurban migration. And so probably some urbanists and people, you know, understood that, you know, intuitively or, or but here it, it, it's really, how can I say, a sort of proof that, you know, that indeed the fate of a city is not written in stone and that you can change it by, you know, uh, uh, with a new uh, economy, et cetera. So, uh, and, and it also shows that, you know, it's not because Marseille or Lyon is the second uh, city in France that it will be like that in, 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 in 50 or 100 years. And um, what we saw is that the first city usually stays the first. That's true, but all the rest then can uh, uh, move. Um, now, in, in other cases, you know, it, the models uh, can help us to identify the critical parameters. So, in fact, uh, uh, when you are in front of a complex uh, system, you know, on, on, on what can you act in order to change things, uh, uh, necessitate to, uh, uh, to know the parameters that are really, that, that make a difference, you know, there are so many things that you can change. It's important to uh, uh, to know that uh, yes, you have maybe you know uh, not the dense, not the average density, but the density around the public transportation, etc. So I, I think it's really the goal in this case for more uh, applied stuff would be to identify the set of parameters that are that really make a difference, and and what would be the uh, uh, how can I say this? Uh, the, the goal would be to understand the the physics of the system, pardon me for this expression, but uh, you know, in physics, when we, we say that we understand the system is that you have a rough idea of what will happen if you do this or that. If you, have, you, know, if you apply some voltage, the current will appear, etc. You know, you, you know what, what are the main mechanism and the main phenomena that will happen. And um, actually we, we, we would like to have this sort of knowledge you know, for example, what will happen if you install, if you put a new train station in this uh, area and so on, you know, so uh, uh, will it attract people or not? What will it mean in, in 50 years? And, and so far, uh, simulation, uh, numerical simulation with computers don't give a, a clear answer or, or an answer that is difficult to believe. So the goal would be really to have some robust knowledge, you know, and, and mathematics is, is just a way to, to, to reach that, you know? So it, it's, it's, you know, it, it, we don't have many practical application yet, but it doesn't mean that it will be useful, you know, in 50 years. And maybe it will never be useful, but at least, you know, it's a, it's a small step in our uh, fundamental knowledge. You know, I, I, I don't know if this is the answer you wanted to listen to, but you know, it's, it's, it's um, you know, it's, uh, 
uh, I know it's not, you know, we, we will not put the, the human in equation, let's say, but you know, it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's what can I say, it's describing an aspect of the, of the system, the city here, describing certain aspect in a quantitative way. And in some cases that can allow us to make prediction too. I mean, or, or at least projection and testing some scenarios. You know, that's also another use is that if you have a reasonable model, you can try to, you know, to, to, to imagine some scenario and, and the what if scenarios, you know, if I do that, what will happen? And, uh, and, 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 you know, in a time where, you know, global warming, uh, uh, you know, extreme climate events will, uh, will grow, we will see more migrations, you know, so uh, um, that's for sure. So can we, can we say something about the resilience of cities, etc.? You know, that would be, let's say, another applied goal. I, I, I thank you very much. So we were almost actually ran out of time. Uh, and I, I'd like to reemphasize, thank you very much for this contribution. The key thing about uh, why this is something that may be different from many things, qualitative people who study uh, um, cities and also people who do data science of cities, computational social science uh, of cities. Uh, this kind of mathematical modeling is important because we're not just humans. If, if you know, pedestrian crowds become too dense, we become particles. We're particles in traffic jams and so on. And I think there could be nothing better than like ending with this particular picture out of uh, Zipf's paper, which is sort of one of the foundational papers of tail statistics, um, where you know, it's cited over and over and over, rightly so. And one of the key things where this is different, and we had this discussion actually in the research lab meeting earlier this morning, there is these kind of things where as humanists and humans in general, we have intuitions about types, averages, certain things being certain ways, right? The unfortunate part of that you can see right now going on where uh, Russians have particular uh, averaging assumptions about Ukrainians and vice versa. Uh, so here you see that is not the case. There is no average in this. It's uh, sort of, there is some stuff that is very frequent, a lot of stuff that is not very frequent. And that means you need mathematics to understand it because it's not um, very quickly intuitively. And so that is something which I think is super important why these two things need to go together. While we need these kind of summary statistics, while we need qualitative research, and in between at the meso level, where these two things are both relevant, where we want to understand patterns that are somewhat regular, but not too regular, when we do complexity science, all of these things come together. And I think that's what, in some sense, is a sort of um, promised land for cultural data analytics, because these two things are still too separate. And therefore, I'm very happy, uh, Marco Tommy, that you joined us today and sort of like helped map out. Uh, sort of the full spectrum of what's possible in cultural data analytics. So thank you very much. And um, I, as every time at the end of the session, I should also sort of um, uh, tell you what is the next um, uh, kind of uh, journey we do here. So let's applaud the speaker and then point to next week, which will be um, um, uh, Sabine Sustrunk, visual computing, facts, fake, and fiction. So it's about computer vision. And will actually not be next week because next week there will be break at university, but in two weeks. So uh, see you in two weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And don't hesitate to send me, a, drop me an email. I'm happy to answer if you have any particular question, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.